Blood on the River, Chapter 16, Page 123. Great blame and imputation was laid upon me by them for the loss of our two men, which the Indians slew, insomuch that they purposed to dispose me. Captain John Smith, a true relation. It is either Richard or God in his mercy who trips me. I sprawl on the ground, my face in the dirt. Grab him, Master Archer orders. Run, Richard cries. But before I can scramble to my feet, Reverend Hunt lifts me by one arm and holds me fast. He is a boy, he says slowly and firmly to Master Archer. Leave him be. I will deal with him. Master Archer wipes his bloody hand with his handkerchief. He gives me one last disgusted look, then turns to go. Reverend Hunt drags me with him to the chapel. Richard follows. I'm sorry, Reverend Hunt, I say as I struggle to keep up with his long strides. He is gripping my arm so tightly it hurts. He is focusing his anger, and most of that focus is going into my arm. He plops me down on a log bench in the chapel. Do not leave until you have prayed long and hard. Pray to curb your temper. Pray for humility. You will need that desperately if you become the servant of one of the gentlemen. I hop to my feet. I will not serve one of those men. They're criminals. Then I realize what he is saying. He is assuming that as sun up, Captain Smith will be hanged and I will become another man's servant. Are you just going to let them kill him? I cry. Reverend Hunt rubs his temples. I have no authority here, he says quietly. I shake my head and sink back onto the log. Richard sits next to me. I had always assumed that Reverend Hunt held the highest authority, the authority of God. Then can you pray for another miracle, Reverend? Richard asks. Reverend Hunt looks up at him, his eyes bright for a moment. He nods. Yes, he says. I will. The three of us are quiet, lost in our own prayers. I pray to learn to curb my anger, but I do not ask for the humility to serve a new master. When we leave the chapel, we find the soldiers and laborers gathered at the cook fire. They are talking in hushed tones, their eyes shifting. We draw closer and hear their plan. There are a dozen gentlemen and over twenty of us. Yes, they have plenty of weapons, but we will have the element of surprise. Henry wants to simply slit the gentlemen's throats while they sleep, but some of the others want an all-out battle, a war. Reverend Hunt scowls. No, no killing, he says. A war amongst ourselves will be the end of us, an end of the colony. We will, we will not even have enough men left to fend off an Indian attack. But the men ignore him. They want blood. And if it will save Captain Smith, so do I. I grow weary of listening to the men argue about their plans. I nudge Richard, and we leave to walk down to the river. The afternoon sun is low. A breeze has lifted, and the river has ripples over its surface. Do you think their plans will work? Richard asks me. I shake my head. A lot of men will die. Maybe you and I will die. And yet, if we do nothing, we both know what will happen tomorrow morning. We will watch Captain Smith climb up the ladder to the gallows, watch them slip the noose around his neck. When they shove him off the ladder, the weight of his body will jerk his neck against the noose. Our only hope will be for his neck to break quickly so that death will come mercifully. I have seen hangings where a man gurgles and thrashes and his face turns red and death comes so slowly that I have wished for a sword to put him out of his agony. A thin layer of ice has crusted over the water along the shoreline. I press on it with the toe of my shoe until it breaks like glass, making a star of thin lines. The wind is stiff now and chills me right through my clothes. When I first heard about the Roanoke colony disappearing, I wondered how it could have happened so quickly. Yet here we are, down to fewer than 40 men from 105, and about to kill one another off. I sit down heavily on the river bank. Something on the horizon, downriver, catches my attention. I blink, then rub my eyes. It is a ship. The low winter sun has turned her sails to gold, and she is gliding toward us on the wind. My mouth goes dry. Is this the Spanish ship we have been dreading? Come to attack and kill us all? They will have an easy task. Can you see your flag yet? I ask slowly. Not yet, says Richard. His eyes are on the approaching ship as well. A vulture circles overhead. Then I see it, the sun catching it just right to show us the blue, white, and red. It's an English ship, I shout. Could it be Captain Newport after all this time? Richard cries. 
Reverend Hunt's words echo in my head. I have no authority here. But Captain Newport does have authority here, and I'm sure he will not let them hang Captain Smith. I strain my neck, trying to see. Who is on board? Is there a one-armed man? The ship glides closer. Shouldn't we go tell them a ship is here? Richard asks. Not until I see who the captain is, I say. I want to know if Captain Smith is saved. Then I see him, standing at the bow, looking toward shore. The one-armed captain of the ship. Richard and I take off running up the hill to the fort. You did it, Reverend Hunt! I shout at the top of my lungs. You got your miracle!